Hello, this is Audrey. Good local time, everyone. That uh, back in 2014, we occupied the parliament in Taiwan for uh, three weeks um, in order to advance the cause of radical transparency. And it's uh, interesting because uh, the Mandarin term that uh, we kind of look at the term transparency or tell me um, has always meant uh, in Taiwan, at least as far as I remember, um, in the 80s, uh, to make the state transparent to the citizens, the inner workings of how the state works, because we're in very new democracy. Our first presidential election coincides with the wire web's popularization and so on. So it always means that the state need to be accountable uh, to the citizens. And when we talk about co-creation, sandboxes, things like that, it means that the private sector, the business sector also need to have agenda setting power. But uh, we occupy the parliament because uh, a perceived uh, and turns out to be true threat uh, from the PRC uh, regime through the um, cross strait Service and Trade Agreement, or the CSSTA, which was the subject for the Occupy because the parliament was trying to ram through that particular trade agreement uh, without any substantial deliberation, as they would for other bilaterals. Uh, because of that, then uh, the 20 NGOs who occupied talk about a different norm, uh, the what they call the rule uh, by law norm, instead of the rule of law norm. Uh, because you see in um, the PRC, the term transparency means something else. It means making the citizens and business sectors transparent to the party or to the state, really no difference. Um, and then uh, through so-called for social credit systems. Um, they track public behaviors comprehensively, offers preferential treatments in education, employment, household registration, and so on, and also shames with disclosure of violators' names and business names and denial of travel rights and things like that. Uh, and through these dangers, this is like a, a norm that is totalitarian and mining surveillance and providing materials. And that is why during the Occupy, one of the 20 NGOs' um, deliberated aspects was whether we want to call the PRC components in the then new 4G network uh, private sector. Uh, and the uh, end result of the deliberation of half a million people on the street and many more online is that there is no so-called private sector player uh, in the PRC uh, telecommunication industry. If the party wants, the party can always plug and play leaders um, as they um, did later um, through non-market forces and thereby uh, each and every component that we incorporate from the PRC so-called uh, private sector vendors will have to do another system risk assessment to make sure that it's not used for industrial espionage or if it's not used for uh, mass surveillance and things like that and the total amortized the cost will be very very high so we might as well go, through, go with uh, Nokia and Ericsson and also uh, develop our own and that's uh, I think it's now branded as clean path Right, part is the clean network uh, program, making sure that people who incorporate 5G um, technologies, making sure that this kind of espionage um, maneuvers uh, cannot be attempted from the PRC. But uh, we're happy to report that we've been on the clean path since 2013, actually, uh, and uh, the procurement laws have been explicitly designed to, um, including cybersecurity, but also other sensitive concerns. All the tender documents must reject PRC suppliers uh, exactly because they use of non-market forces for this kind of rule by law, but not rule of law setting. So that's my opening remark. Definitely. Um, so yeah, when, when I delivered my opening remark, um, I referred actually at a time for the 4G uh, infrastructure, not the 5G. 4G wasn't uh, even deployed. We were occupying the parliament on WiMAX technology. Um, and so since then, uh, we have established the what we call the IoT cybersecurity standards. And I think that's a very constructive first step. Not only do we certify <coughs> the local IP cams, uh, from 10 vendors um, and get a national standard certificate and so on. Uh, but by uh, working with um, international liberal democracies, we can make sure that the um, charitable um, donations uh, to uh, international multilateral buildings, uh, as well as um, other development aids and things like that, can be built on a trusted stack of technology that would not enable by default uh, eavesdropping um, in its initial configuration. I think that's a quite constructive thing that we can do, and actually have been doing so for quite a few years. And also, I guess more um, 
um, caution uh, in the daily use, the daily practice, just like you know, wearing a mask, washing your hands, uh, prevents against the coronavirus. Uh, that uh, can also be applied to our communication as well. I would uh, much rather that we're having this conversation in into an encrypted mode, uh, which the software that we're using do actually it, it does offer that mode. Uh, but um, uh, little habits like this also helps. Well, I'm working with the Taiwan government. I'm not working for Taiwan government. So I'm speaking on uh, a individual uh, perspective. So um, a couple of things, um, like rebuilding trust. Um, I think it's easier to think in terms of trustworthiness uh, instead of trust, which the, 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 the term trust has been so overloaded, it doesn't mean anything now. But we know something about trustworthiness. We know um, with accountability, with the ability to um, owe up to any errors as we did during our counter pandemic uh, and crowdsource the innovations, amplifying them uh, and working with uh, partners uh, in good faith. And these things uh, are essentially what the original uh, Open Government par Partnership, the OGP, was built to do, is to develop a methodology to work on, admittedly, not all countries, but at least uh, democratic countries, uh, a systemic way to foster trustworthiness uh, through this collaboration on data collaborative data norms and open response now and also open recovery I, i've talked at length about this so i'll be very brief uh but basically just engage the basic ogp principles i, I read about this uh what annual or at least the inaugural democracy summit uh, thing uh, from the new administration's uh, webpage. Uh, and if one can re-engage the OGP um, community, I think there's a lot to be learned and relearned about to rebuild trustworthiness um, in people-to-people -people ties. And that is actually the main thing because we need to phrase this thing as a people-to-people -people tie rebuilding, uh, and then anyone who threatens that norm is not just um, stealing, which is a fundamentally a property argument, but also violating against uh, the solidarity and human right, which is a right-based argument. Well, I can uh, chime in a little bit. In, in Taiwan, um, our uh, typo, the Intellectual Property Office, um, I just took a look at their homepage. Um, actually, we, we talk about these separate categories in very different terms and very, in very different ways. In, in Taiwan, there's even an act called the Integrated Circuit Layout Protection Act, which says what it says uh, on the tin. Uh, and the Trade Secret, uh, which is part of the TIPO's purview, is also explicitly designed so that the kind of measure that you propose can be put into action. But these measures will be considered probably um, too much and violating the norm if we're talking about a, for example, trademark violation. So kind of decoupling. Uh, these things I think helps a lot if we're talking about a coordinated uh, effort across different jurisdictions because every jurisdiction naturally care about different kinds of things. Uh, like I, I don't imagine all the countries would have an integrated circuit layout protection act, uh, but trade secrets and patents, these are the beginnings, I guess, of a coordinated action. First of all, um, I would like to say that the social engineering, um, the entire the cyber habit, uh, norm shaping, things like that. We've been working on this for, for many, many years. Uh, the industries themselves, especially around the semiconductor supply chain, have really uh, rallied around this idea of essentially this whole of supply chain thinking of um, protection. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is about integrated um, circuit layouts. This is about trade secrets. This is about patents. Um, and this extends, I think, uh, to the whole supply chain configuration um, around 5G that we're seeing now. And we've been quite vocal about it, actually. Back in the 4G days, we've been <laughs> telling the world <laughs> about our assessment uh, since 2014. So in a sense, we're, we're glad because uh, we used to be one of the very few jurisdictions uh, making the case that there needs 
need to be a international understanding of this issue. And I'm also doubly glad, I guess, that the IRI, the NDI, also the uh, German, the uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation and so on, are all now setting up offices in the front line uh, and then uh, observing and witnessing uh, what kind of uh, collisions, especially around the business sector, and what kind of the enabling regulations uh, that the government can do um, thanks to this, um, I would say, better hardened uh, awareness. I'm breaking from the norm uh, here because everything that I just said during this panel is attributable to me. I'm not going to attribute anyone, and I was very careful to not quote anyone in anything that I uh, said. But that said, uh, whatever I said, I would just um, cut those clips, merge them together, upload to YouTube under Creative Commons, uh, and feel free to um, attribute anything <laughs> that I said to me. And I think if more people do so, it will <clears throat> actually make a more um, internationally well understood norm. Uh, of the perspective that we're bringing to the table. Bye. Live long and prosper. Bye.